Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ronan Wiseman. I'm the technical director for Long Island Junior Soccer League. Uh, tonight, we continue our webinar series as part of Soccer at Home initiatives brought to you by Long Island Junior Soccer League. Uh, tonight, we have an interview with New York Red Bull Academy director, Sean McCafferty. Welcome, Sean. Thanks, Sean. I'm happy to be here. Great stuff. So, uh, Sean, for those uh, who are uh, listening tonight, could you just give us uh, a, a brief background of uh, your coaching in, in the U.S.? So, yeah, so I've been here about 19 years now, Ronan. Um, started in Pennsylvania, where I was working with a club, actually, Spirit United. Um, out of a facility, probably many of you have been there, the United Sports in downtown for many, many events and tournaments. But uh, I was there. Um, we actually created a club called Penn Fusion, which has done, you know, pretty well. We did a joint venture with Penn Fusion. Um, they've done a really good job on the girls and boys side there, very good staff. From there, um, we kind of merged our club with FC Delco, a nationally renowned club, certainly, you know, on the boys and then obviously in the Garrett side as well. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, took the boys academy into that and loved, loved my time there. It was a fantastic experience for me, not only as a coach, but went kind of from a coach to a part-time director in Ronan, then actually kind of evolved into a full-time role, um, which was, which was great. Um, we worked within the academy, obviously with FC Delco, um, trying to, be the director and coach became a little bit challenging uh, at times, but and then had a, a great opportunity to go out to, to Arizona. Um, the owner, um, Ron Burks, called me and asked me to come out and take a visit. I love Pennsylvania, met my wife there, me had my kids there, I was happy there, very content, but it seemed like a good opportunity. I think it was February as well, so the weather was probably nicer. Yeah, um, so it took the opportunity to go out there, and it was just I don't know if anybody's been there, but Casa Grande is just an unbelievable environment. Um, and he told me that there was the potential to have FC Barcelona be the club that was going to come in and partner with us and obviously an opportunity to learn their methodology. And I'll be, I'll be honest, I was sold to that. You know, I was, that was just an opportunity to, to develop and learn that I, we couldn't turn down uh, as a family. So I spent two and a half years at Barca Academy, um, you know, two really enjoyable, um, I, I genuinely mean this, in those two and a half years, I learned more in those two and a half years than I did the previous 16, 17 years. Just yeah. unbelievable exposure to that to that level um, and of how they think, why they do the things they do, and um, you know, just a fantastic environment. Uh, we, we planned to be there probably for another few years, to be honest, um, but then I got the call from New York Red Bulls, and you know, for me, when you talk about a club that ticks all the boxes, both domestically and globally, that that was it, you know, and coming back to the East Coast as well was always something my wife said, right. you know, listen, this is not forever on the West Coast, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so probably three or four months of interviewing, both domestically and abroad. Um, it, it was a comprehensive process, but I enjoyed every second of it, whether I got the job or not. I really enjoyed it uh, and fortunate enough that they, they offered me the position. And, you know, I, I started there at the end of July, Ronan. And again, I genuinely mean this. Have, yeah. It's exceeded every expectation since then. It's been unbelievable. That's great. That's good to hear. So for, for you, Sean, what, what is it about Red Bulls that makes them, you know, so unique? You know, you, you come from a, a very good experience in Arizona with Barcelona and then coming to Red Bulls. And it seems like it's, you know, a, 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 for, for you, it's, it's, it's a real, real improvement and real, real uh, ticks all the boxes, as you said. So for you, what is what is unique about uh, the Red Bulls? The, the culture at the place is unbelievable. Uh, I right. mean, just from from and it starts with you know the, the very top with you know Mark de Grand Prix, um, and yeah. then it goes sporting directors with Dennis and now Kevin Delwell. But Chris Armas has been unbelievable for for me coming in there and just a coaching staff with Brad and CJ and then John Walniak with the second team. They couldn't be more humble. They couldn't be more uh, welcoming uh, and just willing to help and 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 what what they say is what they do. You know what I mean? A lot of people say a lot of things, but they really are genuinely caring and hardworking and, and care for your your well-being, your family, everything. It's just such a family atmosphere there right. um, that everybody's just willing to work hard for each other and go above and beyond. And the connection, Ronan, from the first team all the way through the youth programs, the pre-academy, the RDS programs, it's, it's like nothing I've ever seen. You know, and everybody that comes into the club, we've hired some really good people. Uh, like I said, Kevin Delwell came from Wolves, who's got fantastic experience there as a sporting director. And, you know, he, he does, he raves about the culture we have. He said, it's just, you know, it, it's just different. Um, so that's what's special for me. Uh, and then also just as an academy director, 
you know, we're, we're a club that wants to give young players chances. You know, you got John Tolkien signed a pro contract recently at 17. You got players who are, um, you know, in the first team, obviously, that, you know, Tyler Adams, obviously, is one of our, our poster boy for coming through all the levels, you know, coming from Long Island and RDS programs, camps, everything, um, kind of seamless transition into the academy on second team, first team. And as we all know, he's a, an international now and a Champions League player. So I just love that it's a club that wants to give young players a chance. So for an academy director, um, you can't ask for more than that, you know. Um, they'll support what, if you're doing the you're doing your job and you're developing the players, um, they'll, they'll support it and they'll give them an opportunity. Yeah, as I, I would imagine as an academy coach and academy director, that's got to be exciting to see that they are giving, you know, your players uh, a chance. You know, there's plenty of places around the world that, that uh, don't have that. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, the culture before and, and you mentioned Chris and everybody, you know, I'm sure everybody is very aware of Chris and he's from Long Island. Um, so that, that culture, uh, excuse me, does that, was that there uh, before Chris? Was Did Chris, you know, grow that culture that was there, you know, from uh, before, before he took over as head coach or were you part of that process? You know, how does, how did that work? I think the at the culture at the first team level has kind of always been there, right? And it was before certainly I came with Jesse was there and Chris was a part of it. So I think you've got a very, you know, a lot of people who have, you know, been around it and have created that. I think with the academy, there's a little bit of a void there for probably six, seven, maybe even eight months. Um, so for the academy, I felt, I felt like we were the ones that had to catch up, uh, to be totally honest with you. The youth programs is is probably the best in North America. It's so comprehensive. The work that they do, the touch points they have, and you know, tens of thousands of, of kids in the tri-state area. And it's just unbelievable what they do and the players that they're bringing through. So I felt like the academy was actually the, the culture we needed to change. Uh, we came in, did a lot of addition by subtraction, to be fair. Uh, right. There was a lot of players that just weren't at the level. Too many players in rosters weren't playing enough minutes. Our top talents weren't being pushed um, to older teams. They weren't getting enough minutes in their, their own age groups. So that was kind of the first six months is getting the day-to-day -day environment correct. Obviously, watching the staff as well, Ronan, and um, but most of all, let's make sure we're the, we're the right players here um, for for their benefit and for ours, because uh, they need to play, they need minutes. Um, training with us and not playing is not beneficial, uh, or anybody. I think I think it's pointless. So, get them in. So, there's a lot of good clubs in the area that will develop them. They'll get minutes. So that's what we managed to do. Um, build relationships with, with a lot of clubs and place those players. And you know, we've really shrunk our rosters down. 17 to 24 last year. Uh, we have 17 right now. I'd be, I'd be happy to have 17, 18 the whole season. So that's kind of our mindset with it. Um, and then, but even going from there, I think we've changed the culture of how we train um, and the, the, little, the little details that matter a lot. You know, uh, kids work hard when you don't have to ask them to work hard. I think the American player is as honest as you'll get in the word. They'll work hard. They've got, you know, tremendous energy and, and they want to please. I think for us, what we found out is just they need to slow down a little bit. They just need to, to kind of know that the moments of when they go, one of our terms and, and Chris uses, is go from 100 to 70. Just slow down in the moments. You know what I mean? Whether it's a finishing moment inside the box. Um, because when you have two teams working so hard, it just, it's transition after transition, and it's just not it's not realistic. Um, yeah. So we had to come in and change the culture and how we train a little bit. The coaches have been fantastic and very open-minded of what we're trying to do. And to be fair, I was lucky coming from FC Barcelona with a lot of the – I say a lot, 95% of the, the sessions, maybe even more, is with the ball. It's all about having the ball and with. So it was, can we mesh them with the, the against the ball qualities? Um, which I think if you can mesh the, you know, mesh those two, you've got something special. I'm biased. I'm a Liverpool fan. I think I think they're the best in the world at actually doing that. I think with the ball and without the ball, they've managed to, you know, have the best of both worlds, especially, you know, again, you get world class players working hard. That's something special for us. And I think it shows a humility that we value a lot. So if we can do that, that stuff and work hard for each other and track back and recover, then obviously a lot of our focus needs to be on with the ball. Right. So you, you, you talked about, uh, you know, the, the players. And uh, for you, so to, to, for a red ball player, for a youth player, what do you look for in, uh, in those players that you see as, uh, you know, your coach's eye that says, you know, this, this potentially could be a player that gets to the next level? I think the younger they are, you're just looking for something to do different, something special. We call it, what's, a, what's their weapon? What do they do that's different? You know, it could be somebody who might be, 
you know, you think, oh, you know, he doesn't maybe have the athletic ability, but what a left foot, his free kick deliveries, his final pass, his weight of pass, his timing of his pass. He's just something special. So then can you work on the other pieces? Um, uh, and again, even the younger age groups, not really by a position. It's just what do they do different? What what stands out about them? Um, and sometimes just intuition. Like just there's something about this player. He's got something different. Let's give him time. Let's be patient with him. There's players that just stand out, right? There's players that, uh, you know, a blind man can see he's a good player. He's, he's exceptional, whether it's exceptional physical talents, exceptional just maturity in his decision-making, whatever that may be. I think they're the easy ones, so to speak. Um, for us, it's it's can you see the players have something that it could, could really turn into something at a later date? Yeah. Uh, um, you know, I read a great book with um, the goldmine effect when it talks about the whispering talents and, sh- and shouting talents. When you talk about scouting or looking at players, the shouting talents are easy, right? You can, anybody right. can see them. But can you see those players? I think that's that's the hardest part. And, you know, for us, um, it's a little detail. You know, how are they engaged all the time? Do they not take moments off? Are they, you know, their learning capacity? They're picking things up quickly. Um, you know, decision making is huge for us. You know, do they have a good feel for the game? When they go quick, when they slow it down? Um, you know, it's the feel for things around them, awareness, and just so that's the things we look for. But don't get me wrong, you know, being quick's a weapon. You know, being able to stretch a back line is a weapon, and it's still and it's very important in how we play. Um, so with the younger age groups. We're, we're definitely look, not looking for the complete player. Uh, our job is to kind of work with them and develop them in any, any area we can. Yeah. But ultimately, but ultimately, no matter what, they're going to get signed pro for their weapon anyway. So it's to perfect that weapon, or can you add a second one, or can you? So that's how we approach it. Um, and hopefully, you know, the work that you do, you know, a few make it through. Yeah. So you know, talking about players like that, like how how wide a net do you, do you cast? You know, the the network of, of scouting and so on. Is is it uh, how far afield do you do you go to to find these players? Um, it was one of the areas that needed a lot of improvement to be to be totally transparent. We yeah. you know we're we're very lucky. We're not you know the, the population density here is is, is unbelievable. The diversity here is our strength. It's fantastic. Um, so for us. We just need more people, more eyes. Um, so we brought in a, our head of scouting, Paul Fernie came in. He's, he's fan, fantastic. We, um, Fouad Katsari is now full time with us. We're after we get through this kind of period, we're going to add two more uh, underneath him. So it's a vitally important department for us running. Yeah. Uh, and it's an area where, you know, again, we need to. I think we do a very good job in New Jersey, um, but I think the improvements can be made certainly in New York and you know, Connecticut and things. And, as, and now with our homestay program, we're starting to look at players nationally. We have a boy from Michigan, Carolina. So we're we're starting to look at players that we can bring in the top 1%, the difference makers. Um, they'll kind of add to what we have. We don't want a team of, you know, spread it all over the country. That's not what we want. We want to bring the top players in from our area because it's we like that Northeast intensity, that Northeast, you know what I mean? That mentality is different. Um, but can we add pieces of that puzzle? Um, yeah. Absolutely. So for us, it's nationally. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, what we're going through at the moment, and we've all, you know, had different experiences at our, at our clubs. Uh, what are you doing with uh, your staff and with your players to to engage the players? Because you know, the players that you you're working with are uh, you know, very enthusiastic and you know need to be engaged all the time. So what are you doing, uh, you know, to keep the players engaged during this time before we start to open up? Yeah, so listen, when it when it first hit, I think there's a, a few choices, you know, any club could make. Let's put it on pause, let's let's kind of hold off. Or I think we 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 took the decision to be very proactive, Ronan. Um so we put together training programs um right away, which were at home, right? Okay, they can't leave the house, this is what they have to do. Our strength and conditioning coach did weekly, um, almost twice a week with every team, uh workouts, physical workouts, once they could go outside a little bit or had a bit of backyard. Then with the ball, the coaches do some with the ball exercises. Again, the strength and conditioning coach would do some fitness runs, just making sure that we gave them structure to their week. Yeah. You know, and we even got to the point where we did our workouts in the morning to get, to get their uh, their backsides out of bed because they're teenagers and they want to sleep. Yeah. We just wanted them on a, we wanted them on a better schedule. Um, you know, so a lot of we took this opportunity to a lot of philosophy meetings. We did team, and then we found what the what the most effective for us. As you broke it into groups like functional, like positionally, units, things of that nature, 
Um, we went through that with them, but then we also had them do assignments and then they present as well. So we kind of gave some ownership to them. I know you and I chatted a little bit about some things yeah. as well, Rodan. Yeah. But let's, you know, let's, we've, they've heard our voices enough. Let's see what they've taken in. Let's see what they, what they've done. And some of the work they did was unbelievable. Even today in one of our meetings, they showed that they did a player profile uh, assignment. And I'll be honest, it's better than some of the stuff we could do, <laughs> you know, the technology and just the graphics and, you know, it, it was just, it was great to see that they understood their strengths and they understood their areas that they need to improve on. So we try to do as much as we can, honestly. And I, we just tried to win, win in this situation. That was our focus and our mentality. How can yeah. we win? How can we be the best club in the country in this current situation? And that goes from the youth programs, um, all the way from the academy, and, and even to the first team. So yeah. a, lot of, a lot of Zoom calls, which I'm sure everybody's been on here, but uh, the productive, to be fair, it's been very productive. The players are, are sharp and they're raring to go. Not good. The, uh, you know, so, you know, at, at, at your level, you know, the MLS Academy level, uh, you know, you've got a lot of uh, roles and responsibilities, and you mentioned you've got the resources of a strength and conditioning coach. So, you know, what for you would be the role of a DOC at one of the community-based clubs that uh, we have, uh, you know, on, on Long Island Junior Soccer League? What would be the important elements of that? Listen, I think as a, as a director, I've definitely loved – every level of a director, you know, would be in coaching three teams and being a part-time director, which is basically you're coaching three teams um, right. because time doesn't allow you to do the job very, very well. I think we've all been there. Um, then we're, you know, you're lucky enough to maybe bring it back to two or even at Barca one, we can start to really focus on the coaches and developing the coaches. That was a massive part for, for me as well. You know, what I just mentioned, it was, was really from the staff and the coaches and our departments to the players. But then my job is what can I do for the staff? You know, right. it's a tri trickle. We, we treat it like a trickle down effect. If you're a director in a leadership role, is the job is to is to, to develop your staff and make the entire staff as, to a highest level as possible, because then that has the most impact on every single player. You know, and unfortunately for a lot of us, we you know we have to make ends meet. And you have to coach teams, and you have to do the things necessary to make it a full time a full time gig. But you, what? What gets kind of left to the back burner, so to speak, is the most important piece, which is the staff development, you know, and yeah. getting everybody aligned on, listen, this is our philosophy. This is how we want to play and getting their input, taking ownership in it, um, getting their ideas of what they think they should do with their teams. I've talked to some directors, come up with some great ideas of their coaches have come up with, you know, little quizzes on certain players and, and things of that nature. So just really involving the staff and, all right, this is the situation. This is the, we call it the, you know, the barrier, how do we remove that barrier? Like, let's, let's come up with solutions versus with excuses. Right. Um, and so for me, I've learned as a director in, in so many leadership roles, like getting everybody rolling in the same direction. You only get that if you value their input and you value what what they have to, to kind of bring to the conversation. And I think yeah. we, we don't have all the answers, even though we might be in a director's role for whatever reason. Maybe we had a good team and they did well and we got put in the director's role. It's probably how I ended up with it, to be honest, to begin with. But then you have to learn the other stuff as you go. Right. You know, and and um, yeah, what probably wasn't until the last five, six years I learned to become a director versus a coach who had a director's role, in all honesty. Right. Um, and, I've, and I made the decision, Ronan, to take the job at um, Red Bulls. I was offered the 17s coach at Seattle Sounders when I was in Arizona. And I made this decision to become be, to, to a director versus a coach. Right. Uh, and it's two very different roles. Yeah. Very, very different roles. So I don't coach any teams. I'm not in charge. So now I can really focus on the staff, how, what they're doing, the little details in the sessions, how they're preparing, um, organizing the session, you know, really digging deep into the, the details of what's their objectives and how they set people up and, you know, helping them understand, which they've been great with. You know, our job is not to de develop teams that win games. It's to develop players that walks out at Red Bull Arena. Right. Nobody, will, nobody will be fired because they don't, they don't want a championship at our level you'll we'll, we'll lose our jobs if we're not developing players mm. uh, and that's what we have to focus on in every day in training who's our mm. top talents are they getting on the ball enough are we focusing on them enough um are we doing enough individual position specific training within our week so getting digging into the details that it's ultimately going to determine how many players we can develop yeah um i'd just like to remind everyone uh you know if you have questions for sean you can type them in and uh, i'll pass them on to sean so feel free to uh type uh, any questions that you may have 
uh, actually, so you know, speaking of working with your staff, um, you know, we're coming out of this uh, hibernation and, and lockdown, and we've got a question here. Uh, uh, during phase one, uh, how would you actually set up? Uh, well, I don't know if you have tryout sessions, but exercises, small sided games, you know, four v four, five v five, and so on and so forth. How do you set that up? Uh, I know New Jersey might be a little bit uh, further along than New York, but w what do you do for uh, for things like that? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously our first team came back and it was individual, one player to a quadrant, for example, um, and that was, you know, just getting back individual work, and, and then they obviously moved on to the small group phase, where now you can start to do a bit more passing patterns and, and things of that nature, maybe a little bit of crossing and finishing in the small goals. Um, so I think for, for for us, I know at New Jersey, you know, when we get back, we'll, we'll ease into it with kind of the maybe one coach per eight type thing. Yeah. Um, and just a lot of, you know, it could be rondos, it could be little small sided games, um, depending on what we're, you know, restricted or allowed to do. But yeah. for me, when it, whenever, you know, we're, we're at the stage now, we, you know, tryouts are not something we, we should or need to have. We have a scouting department and we want to bring players in and we want to build relationships with the clubs mm -hmm. where they can recommend players, for example, and we can take a look at them. Um, but for us, we've really, one of the things that I tried to bring from that I learned at Barcelona was, you know, if we, have, we want to develop good decision makers, then there always has to be opponents. And, and I think I was guilty definitely of the yellow men, right? The, the mannequins and the poles and the, it looks good, but are they learning, you know? And we talk about technical training and, you know, I think there's more technical training decision in a 4v1 rondo, even at the simplest level. Yeah. Because they have to decide, do I take my touch left? Because they're right. Do I take two touches versus one? All of that so much more, in my opinion, doesn't make it right or wrong, just my opinion, our opinion. It's just so much better than passing around a cone or passing around a manic. You know, it's just because there's no decision to that. Then it's, yeah. again, can we can we improve their technique while improving their cognitive as well? And that's that's our approach to it. And I remember the Barca guys came in and did a couple of activities. They thought looked really good and were fantastic. And I'm like, no, 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 no. So then this is this is this is not how we do it. This is, you know, there has to be opposition. There has to be decision making there, right. you know. Or and okay, then why? And they told you why. You're like, all right, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think at our level, as much as we can, I mean, I'm not saying never do it, but as much as we can, can we put decision making into every activity? You, I think you see what players are capable of when there's pressure, any type of pressure, right? Three v threes, you know, plus ones, whatever it may be you know, a little 2v1s, whatever that may be. Again, a 2v1 for me is so much better than a 1v1 for younger players because do they make the right decision of when to pass or go themselves? Right. You know, versus 1v1, I, 1v1 I know I'm going myself. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, that, have you carried that through to Red Bulls? Or is it always, uh, you know, and I, I, I get what you're saying, you know, and what, once you go to, you know, a small-sided game, it becomes... <clears throat> All those decisions that you make in the big game and the 11 the 11 game are now in that small game. You may not have a goalkeeper to shoot on, but all those other decisions. So is that something that uh, you brought to Red Bull that was already there and you just developed it uh, as part of the, the culture? So for us, what we tried to incorporate was really getting away with even the activations without a ball, right? Anything without a ball. We tried. We, we have limited time with them. We, have, we yeah. can't waste it have to you can involve a ball in absolutely anything you want to do so that's what we tried to focus on um more time playing less time coaching right um you know i think one of the things we get into as coaches especially maybe co coaches who are new to it is we tend to talk too much we tend to commentate versus observe and just yeah. just watch you know and i think when we put them in a game it's the it's the time where we feel we have to talk the least or at least in our opinion it should be um you know so that's something that we kind of really in this season have worked on with all of our staff is you know the, the art of being wise is knowing what to overlook i guess that was one of the quotes i, I heard and i like it's just just watch and just give them time let because when we start to talk we start to solve problems for them versus maybe 10 seconds later they just solved the problem for themselves yeah you know so i think it's vitally important for us to set up activities and um that that you think what my objectives are, my outcomes are, and hopefully they solve it in the way you thought they would, or even better, maybe a, a, in a way you never even thought of, you know? And then for us, that's what we, we think is success. And 
you know, you're going to speak praise. You know, our thing is, you know, people a lot smarter than us have, have done the research and you just get so much more out of players and people in general when it's, you re, you know, reinforce the positive, like overlook the negative, reinforce the positive. And um, so we've tried to bring that culture and that attitude towards it a little bit. Um, you can still be demanding at our level. I mean, listen, it's um, the intensity is there. The competitiveness is there. So it's can they have the quality during that time? They don't need us shouting and ranting and raving. They just need us seeing the details and helping them. Yeah. So, um, you know, your obviously staff is, is very important. What do you look for? Uh, you know, what traits do you look for in a coach? And are there things there that, you know, you see, just like we see players, you, you see things in a coach that you say, okay, I like this, this, and this. He's got something. I can help bring that out and develop that in, in the coach. So what do you... What's the raw material that you, I guess you look for initially and, uh, you know, what do you what would be your base to start off with? Yeah, no, uh, I think, listen, the question itself is a good one because we often overlook that as directors. Like the staff also have, you know, we talk about key attributes of a player. What are, what are the key attributes of a staff member? And yeah. again, that is a big impact on all those players below it. It's a trickle down effect. I honestly believe that is for, for me, it's, are they relatable to that age group? Like I, I, I sincerely want our under 12 coach to be the best under 12 coach in the country. I don't want him to be under 12 coach and want to be the 15s coach. Yeah. I want him to want to be, I want him to want to be the under 12s coach. I want him to, and he, luckily for us, we have somebody who's is fantastic and he's, he's so relatable to that age group, you know, and it's very different than the 19s. So the ability to be relatable to them and the, and what I mean by that, then they build those relationships and have the trust of the players because once you have the relationship and the trust, they'll do anything. They'll do anything for you. And genuinely, you should want to do every, anything for them. Um, you know, and for me is also the coaches who are emotional control is massive. You know, we've, we've got various different coaches, some who are, who have it, uh, emotional intelligence, emotional control, call it what you like, but you know, we're, we're in the, the business of developing youth. The X's and O's don't matter. We'll win more than we lose, but they need to lose. They need adversity. They, they yeah. need to be in situations where they're uncomfortable. They need to be in positions where it's not going their way. Um, and I think it's wrong. Like winning games is wrongly viewed as success. Um, yeah. I don't think we, anybody that wins that much doesn't at the youth level doesn't don't learn very much, in my yeah. opinion. So yeah. we try and put the coaches and the staff members and, and make sure that they understand that, uh, again, push players up. They're the best player, then hit the ceiling. We need to push them up, challenge them. We move our younger staff as assistants with the older staff on the sessions and vice versa. So they get to see some things maybe they're uncomfortable with and have to be involved in. Like a U12 coach of the 19, how are you talking with a 19-year-old or an 18-year-old versus a 12-year-old? That's something he has to learn, you right. know? So he's uncomfortable, the same as a player. So, you know, somebody's just genuine. They've got humility is massive for us, Ronan. Yeah. You know, there's no room for egos no room for egos at all because they take up too much of your time um, and you waste a lot more time on the guys, um, players and coaches, in our opinion, that it just, it's unnecessary. They just, they just slow you down, you know, so yeah. coaches who are open-minded, have humility, want to learn, who don't think they've got all the answers because um, nobody does. Um, and just, uh, yeah. And the work ethic is that those are the non-negotiables we call them, you know, come right. with the energy, come with the positive body language, come with, you know, it doesn't matter how your day was, you know, you're on a, you're not, you're on, a, you're on a, a soccer pitch now. It doesn't get any better. You're working with top players. You're working for New York Red Bulls, you know, um, you can't enjoy this. You're going to struggle in life and just enjoy it. And they'll, your positive attitude will, again, it'll definitely come off on them as does negative. Um, so you really want the passionate, they know they're there and they're genuinely, they're genuinely enjoying every minute of being there. And we're lucky we have a group that do. So we got a couple of questions here. Um, how would you recommend a coach uh, measure or grade the, uh, the decision-making ability of a player? Great question. So I think, listen, for us, it's have they seen the option. A lot of players make decisions where you think, what's he thought there, right? right. And I, I guess it comes into the, what, what was you thinking? And then he tells you, like, well, actually, that's a, that's a great idea. Uh, that's That's... The decision wasn't bad, maybe the execution wasn't great, right. you know? So I think it's, for us players that were good decisions, it's in those moments. Have they done the the three things, which before, they looked before, 
to understand what they have during, so before they have the ball, during, so they now know they have space, do I have teammates, are they far away, are they close, where are the opponents, where am I on the field, um, and then the after, you know, so just keeping that, that, that light bulb on, are they check in space, receive it, once they do something, do they do something after, it might be give the ball away, but do they counter press versus throw their hands up, or you know what I mean, so those things for us matter a lot, it's okay to give the ball away, at a young age, I mean, don't get me wrong, we're not promoting it, but it's, it's, you know, Barca used to say, which I think maybe it's a bit harsh, they used to say it's irresponsible to give the ball away, but it's unacceptable to not attempt to win it back. Right. So something as simple as that, right? And and we're we're a little bit different to kind of press him. We're like, listen, don't even think about the irresponsible piece. It's happened. It's happened. Like, go win it back. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's those reactions and, you know, the, for us, that's a decision. You either choose to work hard to win it back and react positively, or you don't. You blame right. somebody else, or you stop, or you throw your hands up. It's a negative response. I think with the ball, you know, do they understand and see, how, you know, a 2v1 situation it, it happens at the top level. Where it doesn't matter. Do they drive and commit? Do they move the opponent to go go themselves? You know, does a person understand movement off the ball um, in in a way that benefits them and their teammates? You know, one of the things I chatted with um, uh, Mark Wilson a lot about is, is, is I love speaking with him is, you know, 87 minutes is it, that's that's without the ball. That's the that's that's what are they doing then? That's what we need to look at, you know. Um, and at our level, one of the things we, we've kind of brought in is don't coach the player on the ball. Actually, don't focus on him at all. He's only got three minutes. If he's a good player, he's only got three minutes of time on the ball. Right. He's a top, top, top player. Don't take his decisions away. And but if and if you're if we're looking at him, we're missing the whole game. We're literally missing what's going on. Right. You know what I mean? So what's the movement? What's our shape? And so then if we focus on the 87 minutes, what are they doing off the ball? We'll see what type of player they are, their engagement, their understanding. Um, and then those moments we'll see on the ball what decisions they make. But yeah. it's it's not just as I don't think it's just as simple as on the ball decisions, because it's such a small percentage of their actual decisions in the game. Yeah, yeah. All right, we've got, uh, you know, as a director of coaching, what would you suggest we do to understand if the culture at the club is good or bad, and what can we do to improve it? Uh, yeah, good question. I So for me, I think, listen, getting all the staff together consistently is key. Yeah. You know, really, com really coming up with, uh, like, what – Core values. Do you, does your club have a core values? Do your staff know the core values? Do they understand what you, which each, can you define each of them and, and what it means? You know, we've got a very defined set of core values for us. You know, passion, trust, and selflessness. We live by it every day, right? The academy then has some more added on to that, but it's okay. It starts with these are creating our habits, our our characteristics of what we're going to do, how we're going to coach, how we're going to live by. But it has to be collaborative. It has to be together. Because ultimately, as a director, I can't dictate what you, Ronan, and anybody, I can't dictate to you how I want you to behave. We have to come up with an understanding of our expectations, almost like an, inf yeah, an informal contract, if you like, is, okay, this is what, this is what I, you know, what can I expect from you? And coaches, boom, boom, boom. Then this is what you can expect from me, right? And together, we create this, you know, manual or whatever it may be is this is how we're going to operate this is how we conduct ourselves day to day this is what we live by this is our standards and we we always we don't like to use the words expectations because it means you got a choice these are our requirements these are the non-negotiables these are the things that we we said we would do and we have to do them um, and we have to live by them you know if we say we're going to be hard working we're going to be in there you know doing our hours of getting the session plans done, reflecting all of the mm. things necessary to be a good coach. We're on the field. We're going to exude positive body language. We're going to be, you know, we're not going to be commentators. We're going to observe when the time's appropriate. We're going to let the players solve the problems. And so that we agree to all those things. I think then when you go on and watch it and you observe the coaches and you start to see it being implemented in the training sessions and in the games, that's when I believe you created a good culture. Right. And then when they start to almost like a team, when they start to police themselves and the standards of the, this is not good enough. We're not working hard enough. We're turning the ball over too much. I think a coach has created a good culture 
when the yeah. players start to hold themselves and each other accountable. I think it's the same for a director. Yeah. Can you get the coaches holding themselves to that standard? And listen, as a leader, you have to have some tough decisions sometimes, and some people don't fit the culture. Yeah. You know, and, and again, if they don't, and they, they for whatever reason they feel like they know more or know better, then trust me, they're not they're not the coach for your club, and you're going to waste so much energy and time on them that everybody else is not going to get your much needed attention um, to help them develop. Yeah. And the, the non-negotiables that you mentioned before, you you know, you hold your staff to those, you hold players to uh, non-negotiables also? Yeah, so for us, again, the, the the work ethic, right, coming with the attitude, the energy, yeah. that's, that's non-negotiable. Listen, we've yeah. all, anybody that's played the game, we've had bad days with it. For whatever reason, it's bouncing off us. We just, our, our touch is terrible. Decision making, it's just not going well. Yeah. But we control our work, we control our work ethic. The non-negotiables are what you can control which is your, your, your attitude, your work ethic. Can you win the ball back for your team? That's something you can control. Can you track back and defend, get more bodies behind the ball? That's what you can control. You know, can you at least still try and be positive in how you, you communicate and what, what you bring? And that's, for us, those are the non-negotiables, making sure you're early, punctual, on time, look professional. Um, again, treat everybody with respect, come and, you know, maybe not shake hands anymore, maybe it's an elbow, but come and address the coaches, you know, respect yeah. the, the adults are there, and whether it's the the, the sport um, strength and conditioning coach, the athletic trainer, the cleaning ladies, treat everybody with the same respect, you know, yeah. don't yeah. ever don't ever walk past anybody, you know, it's, it's I think it was, it's one of those, um, Arnold Palmer, or it might have been, I, I thought it was brilliant to say never walks past anybody, because that could be the best day of their, that could be the best moment of their day, right? you know, and it's disrespectful, so it's just, that respect thing is huge for us, Ronan. Um, yeah. And again, it's a, it's a non-negotiable, treating the facility with respect, you know, yeah. not having a sense of entitlement. These guys are given a lot, a lot of opportunities and they're, they're given a lot of, um, you know, things that people would, would really give the right leg for. So they, they can't be ungrateful. They can't take it for granted because there's other players waiting in the wings to take their spot. Right. Another question here, we've got uh, the Red Bulls first team focuses and succeeds at using a high press defensive tactic. Is that a tactic that is taught at all ages at Red Bull system, especially because it seems like it could be a difficult thing to teach? Um, it, it is. It's, it's, if you, I think if you come and watch any of our academy teams, that will be something that will stand out. How they press, how high they press, the energy. Um, you know, we're actually in the final stages of our annual um, training plans for next year. We, we don't go into too much detail to younger age groups in regards to setting traps and, and things of that nature, but something simple of uh, on their second pass on a build out, don't let them get the third, right? Just something little like that. And yeah. then the biggest thing for us is when, you, when we go or when we press, we go together. It's connected. It's together. We'll either win it back together or we'll be wrong together and they'll break it and we'll learn from it. Um, right. As they get as they get a bit older, then obviously you start to elaborate on the whys and the cues and you know setting traps, manipulating them, things like that. But you know it's it's a massive part of our game, making the opponent uncomfortable um, and and stopping them from playing their way. Um, right. So I think when you press like that and you counter press like we do, you you basically impose your way. Um, and I honestly think it's the easiest thing to teach for us because it's been ingrained in the players. When I, when, when I first came, that was the part that did it really well. What we need to improve on is then once we win it, the consistency of our decision-making, yeah. slowing down, like I said, slowing down, like I said earlier, in the final third, sometimes just taking a touch. Uh, if you watched our first team in Cincinnati, the first game of the season, Kyle Duncan, who's our right back, got forward, went to hit his first time, kind of shank one, his next opportunity, just took a touch, Slow down, dink the goalkeeper. Goal. Mm -hmm. Danny Royer, the third goal, same thing. The ball came in, took a touch, took another, just slowing down 100 to 70. And yeah. that's what we try and teach our players as well. In those moments, just relax, slow everything down, and think better things will happen consistently. Right. Yeah. Uh, we've got one from Neil here. Neil, uh, working with youth, 11 year old girls he works with, um, who have probably been relatively inactive. Uh, how would you recommend? starting back up again um again i i think because of the you know listen the ability to do the zoom meetings and things like that and and, and maybe just sending them workouts it, for me i think ultimately 
they, most people in either backyards now or a park somewhere close by, just give them activities to get going and, and touching the ball. They're probably doing them on their own anyway. Um, obviously, there's different guidelines of when we can start back with team training, what that looks like. Um, for Again, for us and for some of the other clubs, non-MLS clubs I've been talking with, it's it's just as, as much as we can, giving them things to be doing, runs, uh, at-home workouts, ball mastery. That's what we've kind of been focusing on. Okay. Uh, got another question on that. Uh, currently can't return to the field for another few weeks. When we do, we can't really introduce opposition based on guidelines for social distancing. How would you recreate the decision making with that opposition? Have you had that challenge, uh, you know, while you guys were in lockdown of trying to recreate that, uh, the opposition to help the decision making process? <laughs> Yeah, no, mm -hmm. look, that, that's a difficult one, right? It really is yeah. a difficult one. Um, I saw one of the, I was one of the dads, I believe, with his son, one of our players. He would just play a ball in, and then as the ball would come in, he would just go and press him one way or the other. So he had to make a decision whether to take his touch right or his touch left. Um, he would be a goalkeeper or a center back where they'd press him or drop off. So we could either play it around him or dink it over him, for example. So just throwing little decision making things in there, into there for an activity, you know. Again, passing a ball and shouting right, so he's got to dribble through a, a gate right, a gate left, then finish. Or yeah. passing the ball before it arrives, you have to finish with your left. So now he has to take a touch across his body. Just little things like that. Um, just think people have done the things where they pulled up different color cones, working on awareness. So that, that way when the ball travels towards them, they have to look, check. Yeah, oh, it's yellow, so they've taken a look. There's definitely creative ways to do those yeah. types of things. But... It's very challenging. We, I mean, we we just tried to keep them engaged. We tried to keep them touching the ball. We tried to keep them fit. Um, that was our ultimate goal until we could get to, obviously, like I said, some some smaller group. And again, yeah. we're not there yet. We're hoping we're hoping in the coming weeks. Yeah. So it's engaging family members and family pets to uh, to create challenges for you. It, there's been some dogs in the videos. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. There's been some dogs in the the home videos with the, in the backyard. <laughs> uh, so, excuse me, we've got how does an MLS Academy measure success and then how would you suggest uh, we measure success besides the typical wins and losses method? So from our standpoint, success is the players we develop for our first team. Um, we, we set ourselves a goal is, you know, Tyler Adams can't be the outlier. Tyler Adams has to be the norm. You know, that level of player that comes to our first team contributes shows exceptional um uh, you know potential that's the types of players that we should be developing that we should be pushing through you know on a more consistent basis we pushed them through some good players and um you know we've a lot of players that have come through our academy that are currently in the squad and in the second team for sure as well um but that's success for us i mean yeah. if we went and won a this new mls youth league if we went and won that this year it'd be great but two years time nobody remember like nobody remembers, and it's not what we're. It's not my job. It's not my job to do that. I was told, uh, under no circumstances, it's to develop higher level players, whether it's identification, bring them in, develop them, and then more of those, more higher level players coming through. That's that's how we look at success. Um, I understand that you know that we're different. Um, winning is this. Winning is absolutely a part of development, for sure. We're not saying it's not. Um, but I think for, for me, if I was a director of, of another club and I was, is can we set certain goals? Is it we want to create more goal scoring champion uh, opportunities than the opponents? We might not win that game, but if we create more goal scoring opportunities, because that's what we were working on that week, that was our objective, you know, that's success. I mean, there's too there's too many factors, especially in youth soccer, of why you win or don't win. Referees, opponents, weather, field conditions. There's just too many factors that you don't control. The coach doesn't control. And the players, you know, to, to some um, effect on control. So focusing on what they can control, how they train, and, and again, how they play on that day. Are they working hard? You might have five, six players or your best players just have a nightmare, just have not have a great day on the same day. Tough for any team to win on that day. All right, yeah. well, can we at least get the team working hard in, in adversity? Can we get everybody sticking together and, and not dropping their heads? And I think there's little wins in every game. doesn't matter what the – the score is um and if you're, you're creating a good culture and you've got some decent players and they're working hard for you and they're obviously having that learning capacity again you're going to win more than you lose 
a youth level in a non-MLS, even a, win a third, tie a third, lose a third. What a great season. You, you've gone through a lot then. You've gone through all the emotions, all the advers adversities you want to see. Um, but setting that expectation with parents is essential, imperative. Like ha having that with your parents at the, from the, from the get-go. Listen, this is what we're going to, uh, this is what we're planning on doing this fall. These are our learning blocks, what we're working on. Just know we're building out of the back. We're probably going to concede some goals yeah. uh, by trying to do this, but understand this is what we're doing. Because they, well, why don't you just kick it long? Like, no, we want to teach them something else. There's other ways. We can go long, but there's other ways to break pressure. There's other ways to progress from the back. So I think just being transparent, setting expectations. Again, I learned that probably too late um, when I was in PA, but I think that helped us massively. And they at least, even if they didn't like it, they had to at least respect and, and they understood that we told them. And so. Right. So, you know, with that said, your your approach, you know, your your job and the, and the staff is to get players to walk out of Red Bull Arena. So your approach to, like, what is your approach then to player development? Is that, that's, that's at the forefront, that's there, and, and that's what you've got to do is do whatever is necessary to get players to get to that, to that level. Absolutely. Our two most important jobs as an academy is player identification and player development. That is our two most important jobs. Um, and, and we design our sessions, and we've really gone towards that. Um, I would say January, we started to really kick in. Um, sessions designed around the, the top talents, the top players. Yeah. in the older age groups yeah. you know we don't need to have team session at that stage you know if ronan is our number 10 then we need to design a session that he's on the ball a lot that he's in situations where he has to make decisions a lot um and then we okay one of the days is position specific so it's we're working on you know receiving in between lines we're working on finishing from distance so we really have gone to the focus of design the sessions for the top talents first yeah players don't know it's not for them Everybody thinks it's for them, but ultimately that's what the, the details uh, come down to. Uh, yeah. And it puts them in those situations where they're again, it's repetition, 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 success, failures, and, and then we go over it with them. You know, our, our individual development plans, you know, we're lucky enough now moving into next season uh, with not only our 19s, but our 17s are going to train during the day. Yeah. So we're trying to professionalize those age groups to give us more contact time, more opportunity to go and do videos. Um, and I think what this time has taught us, we've, we can send them so much. We can start, we're going to start sending them clips to frame the session. Yeah. Like here's what we're working on. Here's a simple little clip of what we're talking about. So now you have an idea coming in. Right. So we've done all this work in the pandemic. Like we shouldn't stop. Let's, let's utilize this. Yeah. Like technology, the technology, they're always in their phones anyway. They're going to get it. And okay, right. they might better understand that. Less talking, um, so more ball rolling time, so to speak. But ultimately, it really is designed right now for us. It's develop the individuals. There might be two or three in different positions. Okay, then one day is for the 10, next day is for the center back, for example. Um, but it, it's very, very individual base room. Yeah. And when you start uh, your your season, Sean, do you have a, a, a curriculum to say, okay, this is what we're going to try and work on? And is there flexibility within that, that you can say, okay, we, got, we have to change something here because of A, B, and C? Uh, let's go in this direction and, and try and do this. Is it, or is it, okay, this is what we're going to do and you, you, you go through it? Now, we, we, have a, we have a systematic approach to the season. So we set out, okay, you know, we want to work, start of the season, pre-season, philosophy and, you know, building out of the back, right? Then, then for four, let's pretend it's four-week, not pretend, it is a four-week block. So we do pre-season, it's a lot of philosophy, building out of the back, four weeks kind of leading up to the season starting. Yeah. And then as it gets going, now it's middle third. Okay, breaking lines, you know, middle to final third, and all that that comes with it. It's, but then within the first four weeks, you can still do some attacking activities, some attacking sessions, but that's more of a focus and it's more of an emphasis. And then we also have training constants, like the things that are in every single activity, which is our pressing, our counter pressing. Um, can we play forward? Can we play vertical? That's just constants. You know, you don't need to. That's something that's in every single activity and every single session we do. Um, so for us, we don't feel like we need to have even have that as a block because it's it's in every single activity. Um, you know, we do a little rondo. It's four v two, but it's it's three separate teams of two. So if it's me and you and a team, for example, and we're on the outside and, and we give it away, we go in and they pop out. So it's a counter press. Like not even thinking about it, that's a counter pressing moment. 
right? And then for the team in present um, in that won it, now it's can you play a you know a kind of release pass under pressure, and then they pop out. So those right. just just something as simple as that is a training yeah. constant for us. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. But then the focus, and as they get older, it's certainly it's more you know how you build out, how you break down different you know teams. Are they playing in blocks? Are they high pressing? You know, do do they switch? Do they get so you know switched over to one side that you know it's a diagonal move the ball to one side to go to the other? Just loads yeah. of that going on to the older age groups, younger age groups. It, it's we play, and and it's I, I honestly. For any coaches out there, and I wish I had learned this a long time ago, is the more you put them in realistic situations and games, the quicker they will learn and the more they will enjoy the session. You know, as much as we can, and as goal, the goals as much as we can, as much going to goal as possible. Yeah. Everybody likes to score goals. Yeah, everyone likes to score goals, exactly. And it's, listen, the higher level you get, it's the games are won in both boxes. Uh, how, how do you finish in the box? How do you create space? How do you create opportunities? How do you protect the goal? Are you brave? Do you throw yourself in front of it? Do yeah. you get numbers behind it? You know, it's that's the game. The game, games are won in both boxes. So we just put them in a, a almost a combative situation where you get to find out like who's who finds solutions, who's, who yeah. does it matter to, you know? Um, you know, does a player throw himself his head at the ball off the line? Is it, you know, is, does it matter that much to him? That's a little moment you think he's got something different. It matters, yeah. it really matters to him. You know, um, right. and those are the things we look for in players that we think is he a pro. Right. Uh, we've got a question here. If a young player asks you which professional player they would try to play like, who would you tell them to watch? <laughs> um, everybody says Messi, but that's unrealistic. So, I mean, for us, we 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 absolutely love the fact that players need to have role models. So I think the player that we would say to them is who do you think, I'd almost throw it back, who do you think you play like, right. you know? So like for me, I was I was never the, the quickest or the biggest. So is it somebody like a, on, on our team, like a, a Kaku, right? Who sits in the spaces, you can maybe play a little final ball, can score a goal, he, you know? And so it's we try and do that as much as we can. Um, yeah. We've also got those kind of players to look back on. So we think, Who's got a Tyler Adams type attribute where his work ethic you know, covers every blade of grass, his, his energy, and you know he wouldn't be the technically most gifted player. They would tell me he wasn't the most best player in the world, but yeah. he just had a drive and a belief and a. So that's really important for us. So if somebody has those attributes of 12, 13, 14, then you watch Tyler Adams, watch how he plays. You know our right backs did an assignment on and they did Kyle Duncan. Yeah, and and, and that's what's important for us is that's do you have some of the same attributes as those players? Right. Um, you know, and listen again for for me. I was growing up. I loved Maradona. I thought Maradona was amazing. Won a World Cup, and that's who I loved. Obviously, being from Ireland like yourself, you yeah. know, watching Roy Keane, completely different player, but what's a winner? You know, even those yeah. Liverpool fan is a man, you guy. But um, what 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 I love, what I loved about a player that I feel is a difference because talent is there's so much players of talent. And talent can be defined in so many different ways. There's there's certain attributes that make the difference for us. A yeah. Steven Gerrard, a Steven Gerrard, the way he approached training, it was just stuck with me. You know, he, he said he used to drive in and be obsessed with being the best player in training that day. That's just a different mentality, right? Yeah. I mean, leaders have that, winners have that. So we look for those types of things in players. You know, it doesn't matter to you when you lose. It's okay losing, but does it matter to you? In an activity and training, you know, when you're not playing well, how do you how do you impact the game? How do you impact others? If you're a great player, how do you make players around you better? Um, so we look for those little intangibles that again for us, they differentiate players who have similar attributes technically or you know, those types of things. Because right. those are the things that are, those are the things that make pros. Yeah. Another one here. Based on everything you've learned at Barca, and I would even add at Red Bull, what was the most valuable thing that you would use uh, most to this day? And I, I suppose you can take that from from every experience that you've had uh, coaching and, and as a director. I would say, from a coaching standpoint, the the thing that hit me the most, and I think would make the biggest impact, was what I said: is to to try your best not to coach the player on the ball. If you don't do that. It absolutely changes your approach to how you coach. 
Yeah. You see, you see so much more that's going on and you actually see the important stuff that's, that actually is the movement, the spacing, the connectedness, those things. We're really trying to instill that in our staff as part of our coaching methodology. Um, and, and with that comes the understanding of they learn best, players learn best by experiencing, not by us talking, not by us even showing them, by experiencing it. Successes, failures. I didn't work that time, I gotta find a different solution. If they yeah. keep trying this, if they keep trying the same thing, then that's when our coaching comes in and we help them understand there's other solutions, there might be other ideas and guide them. But by by doing those things and understanding how they learn or how we believe they learn, that shapes our coaching methodology. Less talking. The hard work's done in the session preparation with the mm -hmm. activities. You know, um, yeah. the, the, the training and the games for them, they just want to play. They don't want to hear our voices. And sometimes I was massively guilty of it. Sometimes you like the sound of our voice too much. Um, and we, I think we need to get back to just letting them solve problems, letting them, and then talk about, talk about it in the natural stoppages, you know, in between the activities, water breaks. That's where I think we'd have the conversations. That's where we can have the, the little, you know, subtle conversations or talk to the group. Maybe it's something that will help them all, but, you know, getting away from the stop, you know, one of the worst things in the world is they talk for five minutes, set up an activity, and then one minute in, stop it again, yeah. you know, because they see something and it's just players don't enjoy it. You know, yeah. we have to just let them, let them play, let them learn by experiencing. And um, I believe the more enjoyment and it'll provide more repetition, more learning moments, and we'll get more from them. From a director's side, the biggest thing was to limit coaching. If Once I get into a director role, I missed, I missed it that I was responsible for the coaches and thought I was just a coach with another title. That's one of the things I learned. And I, yeah. it took me a while to understand that I was a crap director being a coach and a director. And I, again, I understood why we had to do that, but as best you can, being able to step away and just, you know, help the coaches with session preparation, help them with reflection on it, help them, you know, by observing them and, and, and just kind of, you know, subtle little um, points and how they can improve it and what areas they did really well, do more of that. I mean, ultimately, that's the role of a director to, to improve the coaches who yeah. then improve the players. Mm -hmm. And I know it's not easy. It's easier said than done. But I do believe that's when you can maximize your role as a director. Yeah. Good. Uh, Sean, so as you're, you know, the, the, the players are aging out and, and you're producing some players for uh, going to the first team, obviously, there's players that don't make it. Uh, probably go on to be very solid uh, college players. So w what do you do for, for those kids and, and what's the plan for those guys that you can see at some point, okay, we're not going to get you into the first team, but, uh, you know, college is, is a very viable option for you. Yeah, listen, it's 90% where, where our players will go, right? Uh, yeah. And again, it's, 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 an, it's, it's our responsibility to make sure that we place them at colleges where they think they're going to be successful, both on the field and off the field. The fact of the matter is, I mean, listen, Sean Davis, our captain of the first team, went to Georgetown, right? He was he was a college player, Alex Mullen to Georgetown. There's all these players went to these colleges and they've come back into the frame, uh, the fray, yeah. so to speak. So there's more than one way to get there. Um, yeah. It is it is changing. More players are signing pro to younger age group. It's becoming uh, definitely more like the the rest of the world, where um, they're the top talents are becoming pro and there not as many going to college, but it's still an option, you know, and, and if they never come back to us, it's still our responsibility, yeah. you know, is where we, we have a holistic approach. Our academy manager, Ryan Brooks, is developing a real comprehensive and, and top level program to help them just grow as young men, you know, become more educated in the, the world and what's going on. Um, you know, I, I often say in school, there should be, you know, there should be, it should teach you how to change a tire. It should teach you how to, to maybe cook a couple of meals that are easy and uh, things of that nature and stuff that we we need and and that we've experienced so we actually want us to, we, we want to take it upon ourselves to just help them develop some life skills um and and we want to take that holistic approach knowing that one day we want them to come back as a fan we want them to come back with maybe their families and be a red bull fan and be a part of um of who we are um we've just recently started an academy alumni group you know over 200 people you know, the various different professions that we're going to use them to talk to our academy players. And so 
we value it a lot, Ronan. Um, we help out in regards to which colleges. We're fortunate that we're New York Red Bulls. They're going to get a lot of attention. Yeah. They're going to get a lot of various schools. And that, listen, I've been on the other side, but we've had to work so hard to get players placed and work so hard to find them schools. Um, fortunate that you know we've, we've quality players, so normally that that task isn't the most difficult, but it's finding the right school for the right reasons is the hardest part. And we we, we definitely guide and, and help facilitate that. Yeah, good stuff. All right, we've got another one here. What does your coach development model look like? Yeah, uh, great question. So we have a mentorship program already with our, our youth programs in pre-academy. So probably anywhere from eight to 10 of their most promising coaches come in and basically shadow an assistant and work with our academy staff. Um, you know, and again, we make sure that we give them roles and we're, we provide clarity in what they're going to do. Um, maybe the first two sessions, three is observing, then we'll give them an activity to run, for example. So we want to develop all the staff within our club. Our academy coaches are also required to go and watch second team, first team training to watch what they're doing as well. Um, so you can have some formal and then informal mentorships if you like. No. Um, but, you know, it's we have technical meetings once every two weeks and go through the philosophy. Go, and again, I'm a big believer and I have the, I have the staff present. I'll maybe present one out of eight and, th and they will do it because it's up. You know, I'll, we'll give them a topic we want to talk about and they'll just go with it. Because it's up, it's up to, I believe it's my responsibility to develop them into leaders versus, again, tell them or maybe, that, oh, I'm going to dictate. This is what we're doing. This That doesn't, for me, that doesn't get ownership. You know, I want them to come up with the ideas. I want them to be able to present. I want them to be comfortable presenting to their peers. I want them to be comfortable, you know, being a leader that one day, maybe they're an academy director. Um, so that's how we approach it. Um, on the field, we have practical sessions, obviously. Um, one of our coaches, Simon Nee, was on the French Federation course, which is through MLS, and they did a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, program uh, and uh, kind of coaching, if you like. So mm -hmm. that's something we're implementing this fall. So obviously, we'll, our coaches will watch one of our staff members, and then we'll just provide feedback to them, you know, and everybody will go through that process, myself included, um, and be constructive. And this is what we thought, what, you know, how do you think, and, and great, you know what, and take that constructive criticism, and we become better for it. You know, but it's not done in a negative way, and it's just that mindset of always trying to be better. You know, I don't think anybody's run, gone out and run a perfect session. There's always something you can do better. Yeah. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure we've all had experiences of sessions. We thought, why did I even do that? You know, so those are the ones we'll learn from. But it, it's continuous and it is structured. I mean, we also have, for example, a sports um, psychologist coming in for the staff and for the players, just talking about the different core values, what they mean. How can you implement it as a player? How can you, you know, implement it as a coach? Emotional control, intelligence, maybe for the coaches, for us. Uh, so it's just ongoing and continuous running. Um, we're again, we're during this pandemic, just a thirst for more knowledge. Just uh, listen, we'll be happy to get back on the field, but it doesn't mean we stop learning. Yeah, Sean, we could keep going here for uh, for quite a while. It's very, uh, you know, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. It's always interesting conversation, you know, when we speak. Um, I want to thank you for joining us tonight and, uh, you know, and taking, feeling the questions that came in from the audience. Uh, and uh, I want to wish you good luck in uh, the season. Hopefully, you'll be starting up uh, September. Hopefully, is it is it the plan? I know with Things we're, we're hoping good. August. We're hoping we're hoping August preseason then starting yeah. the league up in September. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Well, thanks again, Sean, and and all the best in the fall season. And thank you everybody for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, I hope. Uh, well, I certainly found it interesting. I hope you did too. So thanks again, Sean. Well, all the best. Well, thank Thank you very much, Ronan. Thank you everybody for for joining. I appreciate it. See you all See. soon.